Hello, Faith family, and welcome to this week's service. We are excited to join with you in worship. And I want to start today by just reading from Psalm 144. After we're finished with that, we're going to sing together, we're going to hear God's word preached, and then we'll close with another song. So let's read Psalm 144. It says, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. O oh Lord, what is man that you regard him or the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. O oh Lord, stretch out your hand from on high. Rescue me and deliver me from the many waters, from the hand of foreigners whose mouths speak lies and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. I will sing a new song to you, O God. Upon a ten-stringed harp I will play to you who gives victory to kings. Let's respond to the scripture that we just heard read to us. It reminded us that we need to sing to the Lord. And he is the Lord who defends us and he is for us. So let's sing with joy. Our God is for us. Tremble. 
pray together. Heavenly Father, you see the end from the beginning. There is no limit to your knowledge, skill, or purpose. Neither time, space, or energy restrict you in any way, as even these concepts are products of your creation. Thus, we celebrate that your knowledge is infinite and comprehensive. Your thoughts are not our thoughts, neither are your ways our ways, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are your ways higher than our ways and your thoughts than our thoughts. And so we now humbly confess that we are finite and foolish and short-sighted and simple. And from the depths of our ignorance, we foolishly let fly complaints, critiques, and charges of injustice, especially in seasons like this. Father, we have complained about your rule. We critique your ways when they do not meet our idiotic expectations. We lament the unfairness of almost anything and everything that does not work to our immediate favor. And so figuratively, Lord, we put our hands over our mouths, for we too often speak of that which we do not know. We declare things unjust and unfair, having no clue of what we rightly deserve. So show us then in this day the limitations of our own perspective, the smallness of our lives in comparison with the immensity of your plan. We are but like ants contemplating the size of the Grand Canyon or a fish comprehending the vastness of the sea. Convince us, Father, that something huge and beautiful and powerful is happening around us and in us and through us. Condemn our forlorn and God-forsaken thoughts that the proceedings of this world are little more than a random mess or a cosmic accident. May we see all through the lens of your wise rule. Remind us of how the tragedies of this life have been remedied in the triumph of Christ over death, hell, and the grave. 
Keep us expectant of his return that day when all that is wrong with this world will be made right. And until that day comes, if it be in alignment with your will, bestow upon us the blessings of your comforts. And if it not be most pleasing for you to offer us immediate relief and comfort, let us resign ourselves to your wiser determinations. Enable now our church, our sister churches, our missionaries, and our government leaders to behold you as God and bend the knee to you accordingly. Even used your preach word in these next few moments to these ends. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 37. And I really want to encourage you to actually take your Bibles and turn there. That would be immensely helpful for this text today. I'm going to work through this story. So Genesis 37, we're, we're going to look at verse 2. And as you're, you're turning there, as you're finding uh, your Bible, I just, just wanted to give a personal word for a moment. I wanted to thank you for sticking with us through this rather inconvenient season. Uh, trying to mediate everything we do through technology has been a challenge, um, but it's been fun. I mean, there's just these unique things that are happening here on a regular basis that we're still trying to figure out. I mean, even the pastors doing the special music today uh, or leading in worship it was just us trying to figure out a way not to put any more people at risk. Um, we're spending time in the week trying to interpret executive orders. Uh, we even try to figure out lighting. That's why I'm wearing a jacket now as opposed to earlier not wearing a jacket. I mean, this is a whole crash course in IT and video technology, and our team has done such a fantastic job, and yet at the end of the day, we realize it's the Word of God that does the work. And so we're relying on that, and i got to say, as, as cool as it is that we can start to leverage some of this technology for the benefit of the flock, uh, we miss people, we miss interaction, we miss personal presence, especially when covering a text like today. So we're going to look at Genesis 37, and I want to begin just by looking at the first sentence of the text, Genesis 37, verse 2, very simple, these are the generations of Jacob. These are the generations of of Jacob. This week, I stumbled across a testimony of Johnny Erickson Tata. She's speaking at a, a recent music conference hosted by Keith and Kristen Getty. And if you thought your last few weeks have been debilitating, just consider what she has had to endure for her entire adult life. I mean, think about it. You've been confined to home for a few days. She's been confined to a wheelchair since 1967. It was in that summer that she dove into Chesapeake Bay after misjudging the shallowness of the water. There she suffered a fracture between the fourth and fifth cervical levels and became a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the shoulders down. And even though she initially struggled with anger, depression, suicidal thoughts, and religious doubts, she would eventually testify that through that time, she learned to find Jesus in her hell. That's a strong way to put it. In this particular conference at which she's uh, giving this testimony, she concludes by testifying that one of the particular songs in recent years that has especially helped her was Laura Story's Grammy award-winning song, Blessings. If you've ever listened to Christian radio in your life, you've heard these beautiful, thought-provoking lyrics. Basically, it's a, a story in which uh, there's a testimony to the experience of us as believers praying for all the stuff we think we need. Blessing, comfort, peace, protection for family, healing, prosperity, relief. Kind of the things we've been praying in recent days. And at the end of the, the first verse... Uh, she affirms that God hears us as we ask for all these needs. But then comes the shocking line. 
Yet love is way too much to give us lesser things. Yet love is way too much to give us lesser things. And then there's the famous chorus. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? It's a neat thought. But is it actually possible? Could somehow all the stuff we hate actually be a part of God giving us all the things we truly want and need? Can the trials of this life, the the darkest days, the toughest nights, as she puts it, could they really be God's mercies in disguise? Look, I, I get trying to view things as glass half full. But at what point are we living in like a Pollyanna pipe dream? I mean, is it healthy to hold on to such an apparently contradictory perspective? I mean, think, could right now the devastation of the American economy, the death of thousands of people on account of a raging pandemic, the disruption of the entire world be a mercy in disguise? Could the loss of a child infertility, a terminal illness, a divorce, a wayward child, a broken relationship, a lost job, could that be a blessing? I mean, how in the world can Christians talk this way? Should we even talk this way? And I'm not just asking if such a perspective is possible, but is it even right? Shouldn't we at some times just face the music? So should we have such hope? Well, for sure, as crazy as it may seem, followers of Jesus do bear a responsibility to be truthful and to express sorrow when appropriate. But at the end of the day, fundamental to our belief in the triune God of the Bible is an underlying, countercultural, inexplainable, superhuman hope. An otherworldly optimism. So yes. We should think this way. But here's the better question. How? <laughs> Where does this come from? I mean, if we pray long enough, do we get it? If, if we work at it hard enough, does it come? This fruit of the Spirit, there's your hint, this capacity to trust is actually received as we continue to look to God's Word as truth and see the way He is accomplishing His plan in the world. You see, this newest section in our study of Genesis is a perfect example of how God's Word imparts this perspective to those who trust in Him. As we've studied this first section of the Pentateuch, these first five books of the Bible, we've noted that it is the record of God's restoration of blessing to the world. That's what it's about. He made it good. Humanity messed it up via sin, thus the prevalence of suffering and death and disease. And instead of just leaving things in such a miserable way, God committed to restore blessing to the world and its inhabitants. We're seeing that all through the book. And the means by which he would do this would be through an offspring, a lineage, descendants. The word that's often used in the Bible is seed. And so the book of Genesis establishes God's special redemptive line. It introduces us to the family line that will ultimately save the world. That's what it's about. And so it has followed how God has promised blessing, provided blessing, and performed blessing in and through the family of Abraham and his children. That was one of the movies in this series, if you will. And then the next one was about Isaac and his children. And we just concluded that study last week, again, showing how blessing continues through this chosen family. And each of these accounts impart to us this otherworldly optimism this superhuman hope, and this final installment of the redemptive drama in Genesis titled The Generations of Jacob does this in a special way. To grasp the lesson of this final part of the book, going from chapters 37 all the way to 50, you need to keep in mind that this is the story of how God continues his plan of blessing through the family of Jacob and his children. 
Now, it's a technical note, but I need you to hold on to it. This section is typically labeled or called the Joseph narratives or the story of Joseph. But friends, it is not ultimately about Joseph. Technically, it's broader than that. It's about Jacob and his children. It's about Israel and his descendants, of which Joseph will indeed play a prominent part. But much attention is given to Jacob and to Judah and to Reuben and to the 12 tribes as a whole. After all, this is their national story. It's not a personal history. But even if we catch the national perspective, we still haven't gone broad enough. Because these stories aren't merely about Joseph. They're not merely about Israel and his sons. Ultimately, this is still about God advancing his rescue plan for the world through Israel and his children. And so by zooming in on Joseph in particular, this powerful story heralds God's orchestration of all things for the accomplishment of his good purposes. All things for the accomplishment of his good purposes. Which brings us back to the main point. Otherworldly optimism, superhuman hope. Reflecting deeply on the way God has been at work, even in horrific situations, will enable us to see that the trials of this life may actually be God's mercies in disguise. And this chapter in particular kicks this theme off in a powerful way. So let's settle in and actively listen to this opening uh, story of the generations of Jacob and see how God's hidden ways can fuel our hope even when we face that which is horrible. So just listen. Listen to the story. Here we have an introduction from the very beginning to the chosen family of God, right? We already read that these are the generations of Jacob, the family of Jacob. Here's the hope for future humanity, the lineage of God's chosen rescuers of the world. And we know something of them from the previous stories, but in this new installment, the narrator first invites us to meet, look at the second part of verse 2, Joseph. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now, At this point, immediately, we're introduced to a teenager who, at one point, worked in the family business as a shepherd with his brothers. And specifically, we see here that his dad, he put him with Bilhah and Zilpah's sons. They, too, were younger men like Joseph, and it made sense that he would be with them. But there was, like, from the very beginning, there was some conflict. Something went wrong. It it, it said in the last part of verse 2 that Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. So here's your first introduction. Teenage kid, youngest, uh, one of the youngest in the family. He's helping out in the family business. And right at the very beginning, he's depicted as somewhat of a tattletale. I mean, for others, they see Joseph here depicted as rather virtuous. But, I mean, just an initial reading of this, the text doesn't comment upon. It seems that he's young, and for right or wrong, he's already angered his brothers. As the story continues, here's another thing you need to know about Joseph. Here's some more details. Verse 3, Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. Israel, his father, that special name used to emphasize him as the tribal head of the family, showed favoritism toward Joseph. Now, you got to remember that Israel, or Jacob himself, knew the sting of favoritism. Remember, Isaac loved Esau more than him, and yet he makes the same mistake here. He showed favoritism toward Joseph. And what's so interesting about this to me is that he didn't even deny it. In fact, he made it apparent. He made it obvious. Now, get what I'm saying here. He literally made the favoritism visible for everyone to see with their eyes by making him a special and unique tunic or coat. The word here, traditionally translated robe of many colors, is not clear. Some have tried to argue that it was a robe of many pieces, a a robe with long sleeves, a, a robe with special embroidery. But friends, it doesn't really matter. 
If this detail mattered, God would have given us a a more well-known word. But here's what does matter. It was an objective indicator of superior status. So I'm just going to refer to it as a special tunic. I mean, culturally, this may be a little bit of a stretch. You'll get the idea. It seems to be like the, the equivalent of buying one kid a spanking new candy apple red Corvette ZR1, while all the rest of the kids share the used conversion van. I mean, in that culture, special clothes were luxury items and conveyed status, way more than clothes do in our own day. And so how do you think the other boys responded to this? Look at verse 4. But when his brothers saw with their eyes, saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. This favoritism was so obvious that it stirred within them a hatred, so strong that they could not even bring themselves to say a kind word to him. So here's your first introduction to the family that will save the world. It's fractured by favoritism. Part of it is on account of the naivety of Joseph. Uh, Part of it is the sinful disposition of the brothers. Part of it is provoked by foolish parenting. But what starts off as a flickering flame of hate, the winds of providence will blow into a full-blown forest fire. I want you to notice in these next few verses as we read them, this growing account of Joseph's recurring dreams, his enthusiastic rehearsal of those dreams, and how it stirs up hate within his brothers. Look at verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Do you see what's happening here? Dreams in that time and culture were believed to have come from God. I mean, if you think about it, in fact, none of us can truly control what we dream. Even on the way in this morning, Eden was telling me about her strange dream that she had last night. And I said, yes, you follow in your father's footsteps. None of my dreams make any sense either. We can't control that which we dream. But in that Old Testament period of revelation, dreams were often one of the special ways that God would use to communicate to his people. And so I I attribute here the fanning of this flame of hate to the providence of God because God is the one that clearly gives him this dream, even though his name is never mentioned. Joseph here though, makes it worse. (laughs) He doesn't just have this unique dream about everybody else's sheaves bowing down to him. Interestingly, it's the same word translated worship in other places in the Bible. The meaning of this is obviously clear. He doesn't just, like, have it. He tells them about it. (laughs) I mean, like, he actually shares it. And, And this is the thing that's so interesting to me. He doesn't just share it. But he shares it with excitement. You're going to see, especially in like the King James or in the NASB or in the ESV that I was reading this morning, the word behold repeated twice. That's kind of like saying like, look, notice this, see this. Like it's somebody who's excited. I mean, like the American equivalent is, hey, you got to see this and check this out. I mean, this isn't just like a reluctant, hey guys, I had this dream and I thought you should know about it. He is excited about the fact that they will prospectively bow down to him and they are angered by it by saying in a very poetic and strong way in the Hebrew text, you are going to rule over us, you are going to reign over us. Even without a divine interpretation, it was pretty clear what this dream was about. But that was just the first dream. Then there was another dream. Look in your Bible again at verse 9. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers again and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. 
But his father kept these sayings in mind. Now, clearly not picking up on the negative reception of the first dream, he launches into a similar excited rant, implying that his parents now would even worship him. But his father steps in on this one, and he offers this merciful rebuke and communicates that this wasn't going to happen. And and what's the result of all of this? His brothers, it says, are jealous, green with envy. But his father, interestingly, ponders these things. Jacob, Joseph's father, knew dreams to be a means by which God revealed something special. God had intervened in his own life in special ways like that. And the fact that both dreams indicated the same thing, and that one dealt with earth and the other dealt with heaven, all hint at some possibility of supernatural activity. So Jacob wonders... And so do we. Even though God's name isn't even mentioned, what could he be up to? That question will stand. But the point at the moment is that these opening 11 verses introduce to us the two underlying factors that will motivate this story. There is a fraternal hatred for Jacob's beloved son. And Jacob isn't aware of it. Joseph isn't aware of it. The omniscient narrator, the, the, uh, Moses here, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, telling this story clearly wants us to be aware of it, especially as the story advances. We've got a powder keg of a situation, and it's allowed by God, and it's encouraged by the humans involved. Just keep that in mind. So there's your setup for the story, now things get really intense. I, if I were to, to give it a label, I would actually call that last section the tension. But what we have here is downright tragedy. Verses 12 to 35 is going to show this. Now, before I read it, I, I want to give you some introduction. Remember where we are. At this point, the story takes off. And, and we're wondering What will come of this hatred and envy for Jacob's beloved son, Joseph? So one day, it so happens that Joseph's brothers were going to see here attending sheep near Shechem. We heard of that place. It was bad stuff that happened there. But keep in mind, this is some 60 miles north of Hebron, where Jacob had most recently settled. Now, such distances away from home were part and parcel of the seminomatic experience, right? Like if you're a shepherd and you've got huge flocks, you need huge tracts of land. And since Jacob still owned land in Shechem, his sons naturally take the sheep and tend them from afar. But did you notice something? Or I want you to notice something here. Joseph is not going to be a part of this work trip. He's going to get to stay home while his brothers continue the family business. So his father's going to send him for an update. I want you to look and see what happens. Look, verse 12. Now his brothers went to pasture their flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, And he came to Shechem. Now, did you notice what's going on here? Unwittingly, Jacob's mission sends Joseph, the beloved, farther away from the protection of home. It's it's a geographical thing here. Jacob will be, or excuse me, Joseph will be further and further isolated from his source of safety. And he's going to get closer and closer to peril. Now, as the story continues, the next few verses are going to reinforce Joseph's vulnerability and isolation. It's going to show him wandering in the fields. And even the hidden hand of God will show up again. Like a guy is going to come and send Jacob away even farther. Look at what happens in verse 15. Most people read right over this. And a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, what are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers. He said, tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, they've gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. 
So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Now, do you ever wonder why that's there? Like, why couldn't the story just go straight from uh, Jacob sends Joseph to go check on his brothers and he finds them in Dothan instead of Shechem? But you need to see the progression. This is narrative tension. At his father's behest, Joseph moves from the safety of home in the valley of Hebron. He heads up north to Shechem. And then by, dare I say it, lucky intel from a stranger. I mean, if Joseph didn't know that they were there, he would have ultimately just had to come on back home. But there's a guy there, the right time, at the right place, who overheard the right conversation. And Joseph extends his journey now, in light of this providential meeting, another 14 miles north to, to, to Dothan, which just happened to be located by a major trade route to Egypt. Hmm. Interesting. And it's at this point that the, the narrative picks up speed even more. With the arrival of Jacob so far from home, the brothers are now going to have the perfect opportunity to unleash their hate with minimal fear of repercussion. Look at verse 18. They saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. Here Joseph makes his approach, and yet before he even gets there, they notice him. How was that? <laughs> I wonder if anything he was wearing gave him away. It makes you wonder if Joseph actually has the chutzpah to drive up to Dothan in that shiny red Corvette instead of just using the company truck. Nevertheless, something tips them off because they immediately cook up a conspiracy to kill him and listen in to their conversation in verses 19 to 22. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. I mean, this is intense. Reuben jumps in, verse 21. When Reuben heard of it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into his pit here in this wilderness. But do not lay a hand on him. And then there's that dash in your Bible, and it gives you the idea of what Reuben's thinking of this, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. Now notice what's happening here. They don't just want to teach him a lesson. They want to terminate his life. And it's the dreams thing that had them over the edge. Though they originally planned on murdering him and dumping the body in an abandoned cistern or well, Reuben, the firstborn, intervenes and he recommends that they just throw him into a, pet, a pit and let nature do its course. But he, he presents it, though, as if like they don't want to feel the guilt of bloodshed. But secretly, the text shows us why he wanted to do this. And it was because through this, he would actually have the means of regaining the, the favor of his father. If you've been following the story carefully, you'll remember back in Genesis 35, 22, where Reuben slept with Bilhah, one of his father's wives, and it said in the text that Israel heard of it. He was already in the bad graces of his father. So Reuben here isn't some great hero. He's someone who sees this as an opportunity to win back his father's favor. So it's a despicable act. Everything that's going on here is just horrible. And immediately upon arrival, the despicable deed will be done. I want you to note the staccato fashion of the verbs and the first action that the brothers take. Uh, verse 23. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit, and the pit was empty and there was no water in it, and they sat down to eat. I mean, that, that special status symbol that he characteristically wore, that, that special tunic, I mean, the, the text expands on it. It wants you to know he wasn't just wearing his normal clothes. He was wearing that special thing that angered them so much, that symbol of his status. That's the first thing that they do. And then the Hebrew verbs come at an alarming rate here, conveying the speed and roughness of their assault. The English stretches it out. But basically in Hebrew, it's stripped, took, dumped, sat down. I mean, this was quick. And while Joseph languishes in this empty cistern, and I want you to think for a moment of like an old school well with no water in it. It's deep, it's dark, it's stone. There's no way he's getting out. They sit down 
to enjoy dinner. It's a heartless picture. But while they eat something else just so happens to show up on the horizon. And this is going to spark some creativity from the fourth oldest brother, Judah. Look at verse 25. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, another word for Ishmaelites, I'll explain that in a moment. And they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Isn't that interesting? Another providence. Out of the blue, a caravan of Ishmaelite traders shows up from Gilead on their way to Egypt. Now, the original plan for these, at least the other brothers, not Reuben, he's disappeared for a moment, is that they're going to leave Joseph in this pit and let him die. But so happens this, this group of traders make their way down. And, and I want you to try to keep in mind your geography. I don't expect you to really know the ancient Near Eastern map perfectly, but you, you've basically got like right here, let's imagine that this little point on your screen is Dothan. And then up here is Gilead. And then down here is Egypt. So just imagine a north to south progression here. There was a main trade route that would go right through Dothan. And so naturally they would see these traders. Uh, the, the plot to kill Joseph, interestingly, doesn't take place in Shechem. If it would have taken place in Shechem, by the way, it would have been out of the way. They would have never run into these traders. <laughs> But God orchestrates it so that this whole event happens in a place where there's going to be a caravan headed to the cultural capital of the day, Egypt. And this caravan is replete with the aromatic and medicinal commodities unique to that part of the world. So Judah here sees a financial opportunity. Instead of letting Joseph rot in a pit, he argues, let's sell him. The additional benefit of this is that we won't be guilty of having killed our brother. So again, notice what he says first. He says, let's make some money. And then he says, hey, and also we're not going to be guilty of killing him. Uh, again, no heroes here. That seemed like a good idea to everyone. So they strike a deal with these Midianite traders and they end up uh, with some substantial coin. I mean, based on Leviticus and other Babylonian records of the day, 20 shekels was the average pl price of a slave between the ages of 15 and 20. So they're, they're getting a good rate here. But what we don't understand is, well, how much is 20 shekels? Well, think about this. The average annual salary of a shepherd in that time period was eight shekels a year. So even though they're going to have to split this thing ten ways, receiving only one-tenth of an annual salary in one fell swoop is not a bad deal. Oh, and by the way, time out here. Uh, some people will look at this and say, oh my goodness, I can't believe that people believe that the Bible is inerrant. I mean, look at it. It says Ishmaelites, and then it says Midianites, and then it says Ishmaelites. I mean, like, do they even know the differences between these people groups? <laughs> it's interesting. A careful reading of the text would just most naturally show you here that there's a close relationship between the Midianites and the Ishmaelites. But if you need more proof, you go look at Judges 8.24 in your Bible, and you're going to see that even there, Ishmaelites and Midianites were closely associated. Anyone with an awareness of the histor historical and cultural situation can confirm that the Midianites, the traders, were considered to be a subsection of the Ishmaelites, the desert dwellers. It's kind of like talking about Americans and Floridians. Uh, one is a subset of the other, thus the names can be used interchangeably. I'm a Floridian, I am an American, one is more specific than the other. So Midianites were that group of, of traders who lived out in the desert, descended from Ishmael. But that's not the point. The point is that they were in the right place at the right time. The point is that Joseph now ends up as far away from his father's protection as possible. He goes from the safety of Hebron, to the confusion of Shechem, to the threat of Dothan, 
to the captivity of Egypt, the leading superpower of the day. And this horrific situation seems absolutely irreversible. Notice the consternation of Reuben once he finds out what happened. Look at verse 29. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? The despair of Reuben, who intended to restore Joseph, he had his plans, right, will only be outdone by that of Jacob himself in a few verses. I mean, he is distraught, but the boys quickly move on, and they cover their misdeeds by planning evidence. I mean, this is like something straight out of an episode of Law and Order. What they do here is they take that special tunic, they dip it in the blood of one of their goats, and present that special coat to their father for evaluation. And what's going to happen here is that by presenting it to him, they can act as if they didn't ever pay much attention to it. Like, is this his coat? <laughs> And it's going to allow Jacob to come to his own conclusion about what really happened instead of them having to lie directly. Notice this in verses 31 to 33. Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped, and dipped the robe in blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. Catch that. And he identified it. And said, it is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is, notice this, without doubt, torn to pieces. What blows me away here is the irony and the certainty of these verses. Did you notice the irony? How did Jacob deceive his father Isaac? Through the murder of a goat and the clothes of the favorite brother. How do the boys deceive Jacob? Through the murder of a goat and the clothes of the favorite brother. I don't have a Bible verse to prove it, but there is an element of truth to the old saying, what goes around comes around. But that tidbit of irony is merely interesting. It is the certainty of Jacob's explanation that deserves more explicit attention. Notice that Jacob's knowledge and analysis of the situation is definitive. He says... Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. You can look in multiple versions. There, there is an air of certainty and confidence. He knows, he just knows that this is the only thing that could have happened. His son is dead. An acquaintance of mine used to say that truth is 80% perception and 20% reality. I could quibble with that statement for sure, but there's some truth to it. Some even go so far as to say perception is reality. Well, that's certainly not true. But Jacob here, he needed to know that things aren't always as they seem. You cannot believe everything you hear or everything you see, Jacob. Your perspective is limited to your own eyes. And the cost of this is inevitable sorrow. Notice the amount of time that the text spends developing Jacob's sorrow in verses 34 and 35. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned his son many days. And you would think, okay, that would be enough. But notice verse 35. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, no, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. The text here is relentless. And in concert with the cultural expressions of grief in those days, Jacob, he rips his clothes, he wears the equivalent of a burlap sack as an undergarment, and then publicly mourns for many days. This was just the way it was done. We wear uncomfortable black suits to funerals, they wore sackcloth, and they wore it for days. And typically, such expressions of sorrow in that culture lasted a week. That was the norm. There are a few cases in the Old Testament where it lasted like a month, like with the death of Moses. But here it says, all his sons and all his daughters could not console him. Why? For he refused to be comforted, the text says. 
In fact, he was resolved on the basis of what he knew to be true, that he would mourn all the way to the grave. That's what Sheol means. To the grave where he would join his son in death. And just in case we missed it, the author summarizes in that last part, thus his father wept for him. From a storytelling perspective, what happens here is brilliant. Because what we're doing is we're entering into the pathos of Jacob having lost his beloved son. I mean, any parent who has ever lost a child, any couple who knows the disappointment of infertility, anyone who has ever felt the pain of the death of a loved one knows this feeling. You can enter into Jacob's emotion. You can empathize with his heartache. And all this time, like the text is leading us to this point, the, the perspective is told from, through excuse me, Jacob's eyes. And we would think that if it stopped right there, that that's all there is. He certainly did. There's one more verse. Just as we get sucked into the emotion and the pathos of the loss, we are reminded of the powerful hand of providence. While appearance causes Jacob to suffer in the depths of sorrow, the omniscient narrator reminds us of the reality. Look at verse 36. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt. Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. He's still alive. In fact, he's not only alive, he is under the employ of one of the political leaders of a world superpower. He's got a job at the White House. I mean, it actually seems that Joseph may be moving up in life. These dreams of Joseph that Jacob had wondered may actually come true. And everyone originally reading or hearing this story knows where it all ends up. The pity of Jacob here should not be for his loss, but for his limited knowledge. He didn't actually lose anything. The God who promised to bless him and his family was still at work even though it seemed, even though it appeared, he was nowhere to be found. And from every angle of the story, the narrator shows us that God is at work. Even when it seems like he's not. Every single person in the chapter lacks one thing, and that is the divine perspective. We are the only ones that get to see that. Every single person in the chapter, though, plays a role in the fulfillment of God's plan to save the world. Practically speaking, then, this story, friends, gives us both challenge and support. I think the challenge for us walking away from a text like this are those three difficult words, I don't know. Friends, we need to confess that we don't know the best way for God to accomplish His glorious purposes. Both the brothers and Joseph are presented so confidently as if they know the outcomes of their plans. The brothers, for example, think they know how to keep themselves from having to ever serve their younger brother Joseph, right? If we just kill him, if we just sell him into slavery, we'll never have to deal with these dreams. (laughs) Think again. On the basis of what he can perceive, Jacob is another example. He is so sure that he will never see his son again until the grave. And the story intentionally challenges the the limitations of human sight. Things are not always as they seem. Friends, when it seems that you have been shortchanged by God, it may just be that you are short-sighted. You know, this is just an anomaly of life, right? The world looks flat, but a higher perspective reveals otherwise. I mean, go look around. Step outside your house for a moment. Just That's what it looks like, but you need a different perspective. The, the human perspective is like that of the toddler looking at the underside of his grandmother's cross-stitching. There is so much that we simply do not know. It's so much that just seems ugly to us because we don't have the right angle. We, we don't have enough distance. This this is hard. It's hard for us, friends. This is why I say it's challenge. And this is a human thing. 
in their New York Times bestselling book, Think Like a Freak. Authors and podcast stars Stephen Levitt and Stephen Dubner, they show some research to verify what I said earlier, that the three hardest words in the English language are, I don't know. There's a whole chapter dedicated to it. And what it proves is that it's a human tendency to believe that we know what we're talking about. (laughs) What I found interesting is, how do they quantify this? How do you find out that these are actually the hardest words? Well, what they did was they asked a bunch of people unanswerable questions, and guess what? People answered anyway. Uh, In one of the studies, that they tested this on children, and the way that they did that was uh, they would look at whether kids would actually say the words, I don't know, when they were asked a totally ridiculous question. And so it kind of went down like this, and and one of them, the reporter asked the person, "Um, what do feet have for breakfast? And one kid says, "Uh, toenails, if you chop them off, and another says, smelly socks. And then the reporter intervenes again and says, hey, you can say, I don't know. And then another one chimes, they have your, they have your skin. And another one says, they have a walk for breakfast. And, and they just keep answering. <laughs> okay, next question, next question, the reporter says, is red heavier than yellow? And all the kids laugh. And then the reporter repeats, is red heavier than yellow? And the kid first steps up, says, no, because yellow is my favorite color. And then, Bella, what do you think? And does it, well, I think it's heavier than yellow because, because red is in hell and yellow is in the sky, isn't it? Yeah, so it's down below, down there. And anyway, the kids continue to try to answer these questions. 75% of children were, were, would not say the words, I don't know. They would just make up something. For this is our human tendency. And this is why we prayed earlier for humility in assessing God's perspective. I mean, could we please actually just admit that we do not know what's best for our lives, but that God does? Can we please accept the possibility that He knows and will secure the greater good? I mean, just think, friends, and I say this kindly, but think through your complaints and your critiques and your charges of injustice against God in recent weeks. Do you actually know a better way? I mean, just compare for a moment the things that you pray for with the things that God teaches you to pray in the New Testament. See, what you need to understand is that prayer is not about bending God's will to us, but our will to God's. And when you pray your wish list or you look for God's enablement in your life plan, you need to be sure that God is actually in that plan. So let me give us some advice. Friends, would you just admit that I don't know what's best? Will you just accept He does know what's best? And then, on the basis of those confessions, pray and live accordingly. So here's the challenge. Embrace your limited perspective. Second, Practically speaking, then, this account brings some support. And support, I would just summarize in this, God works things for good. God works things for good. Interestingly, while it's most natural for us to view this opening story through the lens of Joseph, we most identify with him. You know that the narrator does very little to clue us in on his dismay. It doesn't tell us about his protest. It doesn't tell us about the pain that he feels. We actually don't hear about his interpretation of these events until a later chapter. That'll be something for later. But in the meantime, the narrator leads us to identify with Jacob. Like Joseph, he's not innocent in all of this. He shows favoritism. He's overprotective. But no father deserves this. I mean, here's a man who seems to experience the deepest loss all on account of his lack of perspective. And Jacob, of course, couldn't have known any better. I mean, he's not faulted for sorrowing. It's not wrong for him here to cry But what he would need to do is also contemplate if there is something that he's missing. (laughs) Especially in light of what God had indicated earlier through those dreams. What the text is doing is that the narrator is, is having us hold on to hope through the deepest pain that there may still be some good possible in your depth of sorrow, in your impending dismay. Is it possible that he is still at work? Is it, is it possible, at least, that he can accomplish some greater good? Friends, some of you, I know, I have heard this week, are living through veritable nightmares. I hurt for you, but I want 
to hold out hope to you that even in this, God can redeem. Such is the power of history. It stretches our prejudice against the impossible. God does this all the time. Just consider the history of that ultimate son of Israel who would perfectly obey his father and humbly serve his brothers and sisters. And even though he would serve them, they would still slay him. Instead of a mere appearance of death, this son of Israel would experience the reality in all its horrific detail. And the all-knowing father would experience depth of grief as his son would take on the sin of many as his son's suffering would secure the salvation of the world, or at least those who would trust in him. And the vindication of this son of Israel wouldn't merely be a throne in Egypt, but a throne in heaven and earth. And the salvation that he would offer wouldn't just be food for famine, but reconciliation with Almighty God. Full and final victory, not just over disease or death or depression, but victory over the arch enemy of humanity itself, death. Thus, through the tragedy of death on the cross, this Son of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ, would secure the ultimate triumph for all who turn from their sin and trust in Him. So, friend, I would ask you today, as you listen to this, as you watch this, would you do that if you haven't? Would you please trust Him, trust in His Son and that horrific experience and what happened there on that cross and in that tomb and in His resurrection providing triumph, would you trust Him for a greater eternal good to remedy the problem of your sin, to reconcile you to Almighty God? And if you've already done that, as I believe most of you have, would you keep trusting Him? Would you just look back to the cross and see the greatest atrocity in the history of the world and note how God worked that out for good? And I say it compassionately, but then compare it to the pain that you currently feel, the confusion that is there. I, I don't like it, but again, friends, this is how God works. I don't know why. I'm admitting it. I don't know why. But this should at least open up, if not outright encourage, the possibility that the trials of this life may be His mercies in disguise. You may not now enjoy health, wealth, or human relationships. But friends, you have Christ. And having Him ensures the greatest good forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we confess again our ignorance. We exclaim again your goodness and sovereignty and calamity. And now we pray that you would help us bridge the gap in the meantime between what we don't know and the way that we currently feel and what you've promised and what you're doing in the future. Or for those who have yet to trust you in a saving way, Lord, give them saving faith today. They may, turn from, may they turn from their sin. And for those of us who have, already do that, do it, have, who have already done that, I pray that we would continue to trust you. If we've trust you for the greatest need in all the world, can we not also trust you, Lord, for the other sovereign trials that you place in our life? God, help us. Help us to, to endure faithfully and to come alongside others who are suffering and to compassionately walk with them, pointing them in appropriate ways to your promises. So we thank you for our ignorance. And we trust you for your wisdom. And in the time in between, we'll keep looking to Christ, our joy, forevermore. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's conclude our worship together today by rejoicing in the truth that Christ is ours forevermore.
Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> 